There are just some lessons that, no matter what we do in the classroom, it can't compare with actually going to Auschwitz. It's my hope that through this tour, you will experience, as close as possible, what it's really like to be there. Okay guys, welcome to the greatest lesson we could ever have in my class. As you can see, we're in Auschwitz-Birkenau now. Okay. Um, I just want to go over a couple things with you. Um, please make sure you're very respectful and quiet. Okay, we are in Auschwitz. Um, we're going on a tour today of incredible places all around the camp. Um, you're going to see things that you've never seen before. And it really is the highlight of the trip. So, welcome to Auschwitz, everybody. Here we go. The first place we come to is the infamous archway, which serves as an entrance to the death camp. After taking our first glimpse inside the camp, we walk down the train tracks to our first stop at an actual boxcar that brought people to Birkenau. This is also the spot where SS doctors such as Josef Mengele carried out the process known as selection. Okay, so this is an actual boxcar that was used to transport Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz in the spring and summer of 1944. When the boxcars went through the archway and came right to this point, they would get out of the boxcar and then they'd be in that process called selection. Dr. Mengele, other SS doctors would stand right here, they would go right over there, they have everybody in line, and they would either point to the left or the right. If he pointed to the right, you would go through that gate over there. Those are the people who were chosen to live, where you had a chance of survival. If Dr. Mengele pointed to his left, you went down that way, straight towards crematories two and three, right to the gas chamber. That was the process of selection right here in Auschwitz. At the very end of the road, opposite the main gate, is one of the most powerful sites in the camp. The site of the largest gas chambers and crematoria in Birkenau. They were called crematorium number two and crematorium number three. They were built to accommodate thousands of people a day. They would enter the building here where they would be forced to undress. They would then be crammed into the gas chamber. The gas chamber itself is smaller than the undressing room because Zyklon B only evaporates at temperatures above 80 degrees, and body heat was a key factor in its success. After being killed, each body was moved into an examination room to be searched for hidden valuables, and then brought to the furnaces to be burned in one of the building's five large ovens. Sometimes, when they ran out of Zyklon B gas, they would take people and simply throw them into the furnaces alive. To your right is crematory number three. Let me take you over to crematory number two and explain exactly what you're seeing there. All right, the Nazis, before they fled, they dynamited these crematoriums to try to hide the evidence from the Russian army. This is the gas chamber and the crematoria. What happened is the people would start right down there. Can you see the steps at the very end? They would walk down those steps. So this long room here, this is the undressing room. They would then be packed in and over to the right. That is the gas chamber. After they were all killed, then they were transported up to the examination room where the soccer commandos 
would take all the bodies from the gas chamber, they would bring them over right here by these steps to the examination room. The Sutter Commando's job was to take every single body and look through everything. People hid their valuables in those private places. They had to take each body and look through every nook and cranny of a person's body. And then after that's done, they transfer them right there. And over that way, that is the crematoria. Crematorias 2 and number 3 had five furnaces. They were capable of burning hundreds of bodies every single, every single 12 hour period. So this is the undressing room, the gas chamber, the examination room, and the crematoria. Number 3 is the mirror image of number 2. It's just flipped. But 2 and 3 are basically identical twins. There is one record of a 16-year-old girl living through the process. Um, reports are that after she was found alive that she was shot by an SS man. Um, it's possible there was an air bubble or some area down below where she was where somehow miraculously she survived. We know of that one episode. Why did they do like medical experiments on her? She was already scheduled for death. The SS guy just shot her. One of the doctors, like a Jewish doctor, tried saving her. Like yeah. he was pleading with the SS guards and everything. Yeah. He wrote a book. He wrote a book, and in the book he talked about it. Mm -hmm. And he said that she, he thinks that her face was down in like a puddle of water, and that kind of kept the gas away. Highly possible. Gas chambers two and three were destroyed by the Nazis just before they fled the Russian army in 1945. So what we see today are the ruins. According to calculations by German authorities, more than 1,400 corpses could be burned in the crematorium every 24 hours. According to the testimony of former prisoners, however, the figure was even higher. This is the remains of the roof at Crematoria 2. Right there, that's the top of the roof. Okay, let me explain to you crematory number three. It's a little bit different from crematory number two, but it's basically just its mirror image of it. So here is the undressing rooms. Over on the far side, the gas chamber. One difference between the gas chamber and number two versus number three is you can see the columns of the gas chamber in the middle of the room are still basically intact. The crematoria is right there, and if you look in the foreground, okay, the steps down to the examination room are completely intact. So if you go down there, you can actually see the steps right into that examination room. So we could take a few minutes, we could walk around here before we continue our journey. Now this is to give you a closer look at the crematory and gas chambers itself. The people would go right down those steps. This is the undressing area right here. Once they were undressed, they would then proceed to the left. And that ditch there with the pillars in the middle, that is the gas chamber. After the gas chamber had finished its job, then the bodies would be brought out into the crematoria, which is right here with its five furnaces. So we got the undressing room and the gas chambers right here. The gas chamber is completely underground. So basically we're almost at ceiling level with the gas chamber itself. Is everybody see the pillars in the middle? Those were the areas where the SS officers would drop the Zyklon B down. So the 2,000 people, they'd be undressed, moved right into this room, and this was the gas chamber itself. After it was all over, then all the bodies would be transported inside there to the examination room. And then just to our left at this end of the building, that's the crematoria. Crematorias two and three had five large furnaces going all together. So this would accommodate 2,000 people at a time. These steps were used to bring those who died outside the gas chamber into the crematoria for disposal. 
They also served as a convenient exit from the examination room to bring hidden valuables out into a storage area. From gas chambers 2 and 3, we walk to the barracks area to investigate the conditions of those not chosen to be gassed right away. Okay, so now we're inside the barracks at Birkenau. As you can see here, here are the bunks. Does anybody, can anybody guess how many people are in each bunk? 15. All right, 12 people are in each bunk. Now you might say, hey, there might be enough room. Sometimes, sometimes not. In many cases, they have to sleep on their sides. In many cases, you would find out your neighbor died during the night, in which actually was an excellent opportunity for you. Because if your neighbor died, you could take their shoes, you could take their clothes, and you could barter it for food. It was actually a benefit for people to do that. But I do want to point out the conditions of living in here. Don't forget, you could be here in January. It could be minus 10 degrees outside. Not to mention, in many times throughout these barracks, diarrhea was an epidemic. So imagine if you were at the bottom of this bunk, and everybody on this bunk and this bunk, the 24 people above you, all had diarrhea. That was the disgusting conditions these people were forced to live with in these barracks. So I want you to think about that as you move around this barracks. 12 people each barrack, probably people died every day. And does anybody want to take a guess of how many people stayed in this bunk? This specific one, this one, one barracks. How many people slept in this barracks? 700. I want to point out that is half of Montville High School. So half of the school will have to stay in this barracks. That's how crowded it got. At the far end of the barracks is the prisoner washroom. Now one thing that's no longer here was there used to be pipes. This is the remains of it. There used to be pipes all along here. And every morning for a very prescribed, a very specific certain amount of time, like a minute, maybe two minutes at most, all 700 people could come in this room and wash. So if they had one minute, that's all they had. 700 people, one minute. Everybody would rush in this room. There were, there were faucets right here. You turn the faucets, you, you wash your face, you try to wash your body as much as you could because this was also your shower. This was your shower, this was your wash, this was everything your entire day. So 700 people crammed this room for a very small amount of time, tried to wash themselves as best they possibly could before the time was up and they had to get out of this room. So this was the washroom for barracks number 13. Were these things used for soap? These were for soap, yes. Um, very, very small chance they ever had it though. Yeah. The ironic thing is where did they, where did they actually put the soap to? What's the ironic part about it? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't put the soap here for the prisoners. Where would they have bars of soap? They would have them next to the crematorias to make the people believe they're really going for a shower. Uh -huh. That's what they really put the soap. So, but this was a washroom the barracks. To prevent panic and any kind of revolt to the last second. So that's what it was. In another building is the toilet room. I'll take you in to see it, and then I'll tell you its horrible story. So inside this hut's the toilet room. Let me explain it. If you look in the windows, you can see the holes in the middle of the barracks. Now you'd think, okay, I, could, I would go in this barracks, I would sit down and do my business. It wasn't like that. To get in this barracks, there was an SS woman with a whip, and she would whip you as the privilege of getting in. Once you got in, there were hundreds of people in this barracks waiting to go to the bathroom. So it wasn't as if it was one person per hall, it was three people per hall. And these people who are waiting their turn to go to the bathroom, they didn't care if you were done. They would basically sit down and push you out of the way so them to do their business too. So there would be three people in each hall, you were lucky to get 30 seconds, and if you got beyond 30 seconds, the person next line would basically push you out of the way so they could do it too. Even if you're going to like, take a poop? Even that. So what would you do? Basically, you went as fast as you could, if you didn't, 
Like, can you just poop on the floor? Like, so if you poop on the floor, like, yeah, do you have to clean it up? That happened. Yeah. And, and I want to, guys, I also want to explain to you. There were people who were in charge of cleaning this place up every single day. Those people were called the Shice Commando. Is that a shit commando? Exactly. That's what, that's what they were called, the Shice Commando. Your job was to clean this up all day. That included going down into the toilet holes, cleaning all the stuff out, and disposing of it. Would they ever eat it? Like, to be very honest with you, that could have happened. To be very honest with you. That's not even like, but that's what happened in this barracks. Would the woman outside of the whip have like, was it like a full length like bull whip or was it just like a small thing? It was, it was, it was a full whip. There's one more barracks I want you to see. Block 25. It's unlike any other in Birkenau. This was a holding place where the SS would put those too weak to continue working. People would be locked in for hours or even days until the barracks was full. They would then all be sent together to the gas chambers. Okay, I'm going to take you inside block number 25 to show you exactly what it was like. Wow. Man, it looks just like any other barracks. It looks identical to all the other ones I saw, Joja. Wow. But this is where they were left before going to the gas chambers, all the bars in the windows. Incredible. Wow. It's funny how it's so similar to other barracks but it was a very special barracks. Wow. Next, we're going to take a look at the barracks on the other side of the camp. These structures were made out of wood and held different groups of people, including gypsies, families from the Terezin ghetto, and people put into quarantine. see here the chimneys there and there are all original but the wooden part is rebuilt again they had to rebuild this they couldn't keep the originals because of a life lice infestation so this is what the typical barracks in this side of Birkenau looked like if you notice these weren't exactly made for people guess what they were made for Cattle. horses mm -hmm. this was originally stables for German horses and they just converted into barracks for prisoners here in Auschwitz Birkenau so this is converted stables on this side of the camp. As we leave the barracks, we make our way to see the former SS headquarters and an unfinished area of the camp commonly called Mexico. All right, guys, let me just explain everything that's around us. I'll go from start to finish here. All right, the first thing off to our left, you see the big cross on top? This today is actually a Catholic religious institutional building, but it used to be the main administrative headquarters of the SS. The SS who were in Birkenau, they lived there in several barracks behind that other building. So this is where the SS would live if they were in charge of Birkenau. Over here, See this field here? You can actually see the foundations of some barracks. Do you see it? Hey, this area of, of Birkenau was called Mexico. They were building it in 1944. They never finished this area. So Auschwitz was supposed to be bigger than it really even was, but they never finished building the area. Mexico, Mexico. Mexico was just an extension with more barracks to house more prisoners. It was never completed, so it never became a certain a barracks for a certain type of people or a different group. Why did they name it Mexico? Well, because there was an area called Canada down there, and they figured that if Canada, they'll have an area called Mexico as well. Yeah. 
Why is that an active church? Like how, like why? That's a great question. Why is that an active church today? Please don't forget guys, the Polish people, all right, were heavily persecuted by the Nazis. Remember, being Polish was just one step above being Jewish. And so, guys, the Auschwitz camp was actually established for Polish political prisoners at first. So many, many Polish people died here too. And for years, Poland's attitude was, this was not just a place where Jewish people died, but it was also a place where many Polish people died. And so that's the big reason why today that has become a church. That's a great question. The church itself is very controversial, as many Jews see it as being inappropriate in what is basically the world's largest Jewish cemetery. All right, guys, follow me, and we're going to head down this road here. Our next stop is to visit the site of gas chambers 4 and 5. So much like nature, you know? All butterflies. Yeah, you never flowers. expected to be like this tranquil after like, you know, the Holocaust happened here. It's almost like symbolic, like, you know? Okay, follow me and we're going to walk to crematorium number 5. Gas chambers 4 and 5 were smaller than numbers 2 and 3 and could handle about 800 people at a time. They would undress in a large room in the middle of the building, then be herded into the three gas chamber rooms. Afterward, they would be moved into the crematorium to be burned. Okay, guys. This is crematorium number five. Okay, it's identical twin crematorium number four is right over the other side, which we'll walk to in a couple minutes. Okay, these were built together. They were built in 1943. If you look, there's an original picture of the structure. The trees are all around it, as you can see. Okay? The people, they would undress. They would literally go right in this entrance right here. And in the large room right there where the pile of bricks are today, that was the undressing room the people would then be moved into these couple of rooms over here. The gas chambers themselves are right here at the corner. There was a couple different rooms that served as gas chambers. Once all the people were dead, the Sutter commander would then take the bodies and then bring them to the other side of the crematorium where they would burn the bodies over there. So undressing room in the middle, gas chambers here on the left hand side, <laughs> The ovens were on the right-hand side. That would be very efficient. It's the way they designed it. I understand that. It does seem a little inefficient, but that's the... Because you're going from this end right. to that end, like going back and forth. Right. The, that, that's the way they were built. Okay. Is that a watchtower in the corner? That's a watchtower in the corner, absolutely. And it, guys, right in this building, well over one, 200,000 people were murdered right here. If you follow me, there's an exhibit right there that I just have to show you. Come on. Okay. In 1944, there was an underground movement in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And their, one of their main goals was to get the information of what's <laughs> happening outside so the people of the world would know what's happening here. They smuggled in a camera and under someone's coat, they took these three photographs. This is a photograph of women undressing, literally right there at that spot. They're all undressing, and they're moving into this building, crematory number five. Then this picture, this is after the gassing. This was a day where the ovens in crematory number five either broke down, or there were simply so many bodies, the ovens couldn't handle the capacity. They took all the bodies outside, and the Sutter Commando is right here burning them instead. The third photograph shows the same thing. Burning the bodies, and they're being stripped naked, being walking right into crematory number five.
Okay, guys, let's move on. Gas chamber number four was the epicenter of a prisoner revolt in October 1944. Aware of their certain death, the prisoners used explosives to detonate the oven room in a defiant suicide. It was damaged beyond repair and never used again. Okay, so this is crematoria number four. Number four is the identical twin of crematoria five right over there. We are looking at the area where the ovens were placed. And the ovens were here, the, that big, large middle room right there, you can see it. That was the undressing room. At the far end there was the gas chamber itself. Okay. This was actually a pretty famous uh, crematorium because in November 1944, the 12th Sonder Commando at Auschwitz rose up in rebellion. And as part of the rebellion, they destroyed this crematorium. Crematorium number four was destroyed in the rebellion, November of 44. So after November of 44, this crematorium never operated again. They never rebuilt it. They never rebuilt it. Because only two months later, the Soviet army came through. So it's an identical twin of number five. Over yeah. here, okay, again, these are ash pits right here again. See the ground right here? See how it's gray? See it? Guys, this is human bone meal. These are the remains of the people who were gassed at crematories number four and five. It is all over this area to a depth of 10 feet. Here. Anything that's the gray stone, the guys, gray that's the, that's bone meal. Yeah. This is where they dumped all the ashes after they were done with them in the ovens right there. It's pretty sick, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's, let's move down crematory number four to the path. Right, let's go by the side here. Okay, sure. And as you can see right here, this is a picture of crematory number four used to look like. Here is the map. Again, the ovens are right here, the main undressing room, and the gas chambers. As you can see, crematory number five had three different gas chambers in three different rooms. So the letter A represents the three gas chambers in this crematoria. And again, as it says here, on October 7th, 1944, Sergeant Commando revolted and destroyed this crematoria. They had enough time to completely destroy it? Yeah. No one was watching? You guys, it, oh, by the way, guys, the, uh, the rebellion of the, of the uh, Sergeant Commando, they all died. But again, just like Mordecai and Alevich, they died with honor. You know, they died fighting for their freedom. They didn't die in a gas chamber. And to them, that made all the difference. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. It says D and G are the same thing. Yes, there were so many people by 1944, they actually had to construct another get, uh, another undressing room. If you notice in the pictures that we saw, crematory number five, you notice they were undressing outside because there were so many people, the rooms just couldn't handle the amount anymore. So they actually had to build another barracks to accommodate more undressing huts. It's really interesting how much bigger the undressing rooms are than the gas chambers. Yes, really and there's a big reason for that. Because it needed to be temperature right. activated. Right, because the gas chambers are smaller than the undressing rooms. It had to be that way. The gas chambers had to operate at 85 degrees to make it perfect. And so they had to be very tight because body heat was actually essential in the process of extermination. The body heat would keep the gas chambers at a certain temperature and that was all part of the process.
That's why the adjusting room is bigger than the gas chambers itself. That was a great question. Any other questions? Okay, follow me. Our next stop is to the remains of a structure called the Little White House. It was one of the very first makeshift gas chambers. The house was actually there when they built this camp. Before crematorias, two, three, four, and five were constructed. This was used as one of the first gas chambers in all of Birkenau. This was a structure that had already existed before they were building the camp itself. This became known as the Little White House. Guys, I know it looks very small, but they would gas hundreds of people in this structure. They started doing this in 1942. It was located in the back area, away from any homes, and so the Nazis said this was a perfect place to actually build a gas chamber. And so they converted this farmhouse into a gas chamber itself known as the Little White House. Again, one of the very first structures that was, that was, uh, was uh, used here as a death camp. Again, very small looking, isn't it? But it fit hundreds of people. Any questions here? Yeah, it's one of the very first, uh, very first gas chambers. Now notice how I said it was one of the very first gas chambers. I didn't say it was the very first gas chamber, did I? No, you no. didn't. The very first gas chamber is called the Little Red House, and it's down that path right there. Okay? All right, let's go. Our walk to the Little Red House takes us through a very isolated area of Auschwitz-Birkenau. In this area is a little-known memorial to not only the most forgotten victims of the death camps, but to the first people that were gassed, Soviet prisoners of war. So because it was the very first gas chamber. It's gonna be a good 10 minute walk, okay? Okay, right here, if you look right behind the fence, do you see that memorial with the big star? This is the memorial to all the Soviet prisoners of war who died at Birkenau. Don't forget, Russians are Slavic peoples. And to the Nazis, Slavs were again, just like Polish people. They were just one step above Jews. They were basically considered dirt. And because they were considered racially inferior by the Nazis, the Nazis used Polish POWs to experiment on, especially when it comes to the very first gas chambers. So the first people to be gassed in December 1941 in Auschwitz were Soviet prisoners of war. And tens of thousands of Soviet POWs are going to die in camps. And so that is the memorial to all the Soviet soldiers who died in captivity from the Nazis. If you were captured by the Nazis and you were a Russian soldier, the chances of you getting out and returning home okay, were 3%. 97% chance you are not going to make it back to Russia. That's how bad the Nazis treated Soviet POWs. So this is their memorial in Birkenau today. Any questions? All right, guys, let's see the little red house. Guys, I was almost crying last night, thinking this is the best lesson I could ever give the students. You know, nothing we do in the classroom could possibly compare to doing this, being in Auschwitz-Birkenau in real life. Agreed. This is it right here. This is the site of what they called the Little Red House. It was a converted cottage. They boarded it all up. They bricked all the windows up. And this was the very first gas chamber in Birkenau. It was started in 1942, well before all the big, big crematoriums were built over in the main camp. This was the very, very first gas chamber. Hundreds of people, we packed into this little red house and would be killed. And people are living Yes, and if you notice, 
people live, live right around it. Look at the house right there. Their roof just overlooks it. Those people, like, did they live there? Like, during the... No, because during World War II, the people who lived in this would have been uh, forcibly evicted. Right, but they lived here like while this was all happening? Before. They lived in the town of Auschwitz, yes. Actually, you know what the name of this town is? Right here? This is Birkenau. That's what Auschwitz-Birkenau gets its name from. There's an Auschwitz and a Birkenau. Of course, today the names are um, Polish, not German. Birkenau is German. But this was the very first site of the very first gas chamber. Are the people that live over there like anti-Semitic? No, it, it's in their culture. This is a fact of reality. There are hundreds of Nazi concentration camps, and it's a fact of reality that you might live nearby one. Like right. Yeah, it, it's just so far into the American way of life, isn't it? It's so far into what we know. But yeah, absolutely. People live right next to the, the Little Red House site. Yeah. Oh, any other questions right now? So, like, people, when they get their mail delivered, they have to come through Auschwitz to come deliver their mail? Yes. That is... Yep. That's right. That's, you got it. Any other questions? Okay, follow me. On our way back, we discovered a shocking and harsh reminder of hate. Now, obviously, guys, anti-Semitism still exists in Europe. And one thing that just happens to be here in Auschwitz is some anti-Semitic graffiti. If you look right here, Jewish star with the cross on it, an X. There's still anti-Semitism in Europe. Even at Auschwitz. Even at Auschwitz. Yep. Crazy. Sad. Insane. The next area we're going to was known as Canada. It was called this because Canada means land of plenty. This was a section of the camp where all the possessions the Nazis took from the victims were stored. Prisoners would separate the items by category and then they were shipped back to Germany. When the Soviet army liberated Auschwitz in 1945, they found the buildings in Canada loaded with clothes, shoes, and personal items. Okay, so this is the area of Birkenau that was known as Canada. This was an area where they would store all the loot taken away from the people that were brought here. All their possessions, their clothes, their shoes, their personal effects would all be separated and stored in these barracks. As you can see, here is a photograph and what Canada used to look like, it was more than a dozen barracks just filled with material up to the ceiling. If you come with me, there is a little preserved site where they found a bunch of personal items. I'll show you that. This is a preserved example of what the Allied soldiers found in 1945 when they got to Canada. This is 100% real. This is not fabricated, this is not made up. This is actually the possessions of the Jews who were murdered in Auschwitz. Look closely, you'll see all different kinds of objects. You'll see razors, you'll see silverware, pots. Just take a look around it. There's a piece of a dish, a button, scissors. There's a Jewish star over there. Where's that? Right over there? Wait. On this piece of paper. Symbol. Let me see it. There's a little white piece of paper. Ice. Oh, okay. Boy, what do you think that is? Probably like a prayer. Yeah. Who 
brooch is like a charm or a brooch. See it right there? Take a look at that. Like someone's brooch? Mm hmm. That right there? How come there's so much silverware? Why are there so many eating utensils? Why is there what? Why are there so many eating utensils? Well, because they, they would pack so it was silverware. So oh. You just have to think to yourself. These objects were all part of somebody's life. A life that was destroyed. Right next to Canada is the main disinfection building, more commonly called the Bath and Sauna House. The sauna and bathhouse building is incredibly important because from 1943 to 1945, it's where the prisoners, who were chosen to live, were registered and inducted into the camp. Here, they would lose their possessions, have their hair shaved, get showered, and be given the famous striped pajama uniforms and tattoo numbers. It's also where, from time to time, the SS would de-louse the prisoners and their clothes to prevent epidemics from spreading. This was mainly done to prevent the spread of disease to the SS men, not to help the prisoners. Our next stop is to go into the bath and sauna house. This is where people were tattooed, this is where they were given a shower, and this is where they were given their prison uniforms. A lot of stuff to see in here, so let's go. This is where their clothes, all their valuables, would be given into the SS, and of course they would never see it again. This was the first step in their dehumanization. How was this picture taken? This picture was taken by the SS. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was an SS photograph. It's with the glass in order to preserve it. Right, then we're working on glass to preserve the, uh, the original floor. Yep. And this is where people who were assigned to Canada would actually sort through all the prisoners' belongings. Is that real belongings? That's real clothes, yes. That's real stuff from Auschwitz. In this room, prisoners assigned to Canada searched the clothing and luggage of the people that had just arrived. They were looking for hidden valuables and money. Once the search was completed, the clothes were disinfected right here in the sauna building and then stored over in Canada before being sent back to Germany. After having all their clothes taken away, the naked prisoners were herded along this corridor to the shower room. The confiscated clothing from the Jewish victims, or taken from prisoners during the sporadic camp delousing operations, was disinfected in these chambers using hot air. they would use to deal out the clothes. Because even though, even prisoners, after a while, the Nazis would take their prisoner clothes, the striped pajamas, and deal out them in here. Again, they wanted to make sure the health of the SS was taken care of. So they would deal out prisoner uniforms on a few occasions. So you're here. What does this say? Okay. Do you know what it means? Shower room. This room is a very famous room. This is the room where they cut all the girls' hair off. Okay? All the girls' hair was cut off. It was used from making mattresses to making socks. All different sorts of uses for, for the human hair. But this is the room where they get their hair cut off. Yeah. What, do you mean, what does that mean in 
threaten escape. Where does it say that? In order to make the listeners conspicuous. Oh, if a girl had her hair shaved, that might be a little bit, you know, mysterious if they ever escape. All the people in town looking at girls with their hair shaved. You don't see that. And so that was a big clue. This person escaped from Auschwitz. But when their hair grew back, they just cut it off again? Right. Yes. How long were they like, grow up? Just like a little bit? Just a little bit. Not to mention that you were so malnourished, your hair really didn't grow that much. What's in that book? Your hair did grow back and then recut it off? Yeah. Yep. Watch out, guys. I'm over here. Hey, this is another shower room where prisoners were showered. Don't forget, they came here by the hundreds. So there were multiple shower rooms. Was this on purpose to humiliate them at the big window? Of course. One big purpose was to humiliate them. In this room, after the prisoners had taken their shower, they would basically just be transported this room, totally naked, freezing or burning hot, and they would wait until they were given their uniforms, their striped pajamas. How long they waited? It all depended on what the SS felt. If they just wanted to humiliate the Moors to naked like that, they'd let them go for hours at a time. So they would all be herded in this room and just wait for their striped pajamas. Again, these are the machines that deal out the clothes. Okay, guys, this is one of the most famous rooms of all. This was the room where they were given their striped pajamas. So this is where they would walk to, to get their striped pajamas. And don't forget, they would throw them a shirt, throw them pants, and throw them their clocks. It could be any size. You could get an extra, extra large, you could get a small, you could get a size 14 shoe, you could get a size 5 shoe, and they would do it to humiliate you. They would do it on purpose. So this is the room where they were given their straight pajamas. Okay. Everybody see this cart through the windows. Okay. This cart was recovered from the bottom of one of the ash pits. So this cart was actually used to put all the ashes in to dump into the pond. And they recovered that from the ash pond itself. That's an amazing artifact right there. Take a look at that. After exiting the sauna building, we have time to visit one more place, located somewhere in the woods next to gas chamber number five. So Mr. Butchko, for the kids at home, where are we going? We are going to find the large ash field in the middle of Birkenau. It's a huge area where not even trees can grow because there's so much human bone meal. Mr. Butchko, have you ever been there before? I have never been there before. This is Are you completely excited? unexplored new territory for us. Of all the ash pits in Auschwitz-Birkenau, this is the biggest one of them all. As you can see, only grass grows here. They see they're coming right now. That's because trees can't grow in this spot because there's so much human bone meal down so far that trees can't even take root here. This is by far the largest field of human ashes in all of Auschwitz. And you're here today to see it. Amazing how big this place is. To complete our journey at Auschwitz-Birkenau, we're going back to the entrance to go inside the infamous archway and get a bird's eye view of the camp.
Wow, so this is from the top of the archway in Auschwitz-Birkenau. You can see the entire camp from here. There's the barracks. Of course, there's the railway down to crematories two and three. And there's the rest of it. Absolutely incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. This is how high it is, if you can see. Wow. All right, I think you've seen enough for today. But before we end the tour, I want to share with you how the students reflected upon the experience. You go. Okay, so basically, there's kind of no way to prepare yourself for when you come here. I mean, I knew I was going to be upset by what was around me because of everything I learned in class and all of the terrible things that happened here at Auschwitz, but you can't, there's no real way to prepare for the feeling that you're overcome with when you at first see it in real life. It's just like breathtaking is the only way I can describe it. And I think it's really important for people to come here and see the kind of cruelty that like can happen so it never happens again. Being at Auschwitz is extremely powerful and seeing um, the Nazis works makes you feel very small and it's really a good warning of what could come. Um, if people believe they're superior to others. Like everyone else said, you aren't prepared for what you're about to see at Auschwitz, even if you think you're gonna. There's really no more like powerful thing than walking down these streets like towards a gate and just like realizing you're walking on like the same piece of land people walked on to their deaths and to the ones that did get a chance to survive. They just were trying to survive. They'd walk to work. They'd walk to like get the little bit of food they could get. They're just trying to survive and you're just walking the same land today. That's the most powerful thing you can do, is walk in our footsteps. So to the students who are wondering if you really should come on this trip, it really is a different experience. I mean, you know, the videos in the, in the classroom, you really just see the highlight reel, but when you actually come to Auschwitz and you see all these sites, it's like you're behind the scenes and you really feel, you know, everything. It's just so unsettling how, you know, you see the bone meal on the ground. and It's just truly an experience that you really, really should do. I can't really describe the feeling of being here. Um, it's kind of like you, you look at it in class and you watch all the field trips and you understand it, but you don't have the same feelings until you actually come here. Like, people that died walk to their death on this path and you're, you're standing where people have been shot and you don't understand until you have a feeling like you walk through the gate and all of a sudden your mood completely changes everything's just ears ears indescribable and you come to germany or europe and you think oh i saw everything in class i know all about it i heard the stories i watched it in class field trips you have no idea what it's like to be here. Like, you should really come on the trip. It's like, you can just feel the pain and the suffering in the air. It's awful, and you should really experience it for yourself. I really hope you enjoyed our tour today, and everything you saw here, you take with you. And I also want you to remember, it's not just my job, but it's also your job to tell people what you saw here so that it can never happen again. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next field trip.